those books. They're $22 and the proceeds go to the Historical Society. If someone wants one, I would be happy. I know there's a couple people I'm going to go get um, in the box to get some books, but is there anyone else that wants a book tonight? Okay, go once, <laughs> go <going> twice. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. somebody around for me. <laughs> I should say before oh, before Chris starts, turn off all pagers and cell phones. Oh, oh yeah, that's a good them. idea. I'd like to introduce Paul. <laughs> Is that it? Oh, gee, I thought you were going to go through my whole history. I don't know your history. Well, then I'll, I'll go through my history. Good evening. I'm Paul Richardson, uh, past president of the Green Hills Historical Society. And I have a passion about uh, the Greenbelt towns. Oh, yeah. And first of all, I'd like to ask how many of you watched any or all of the Roosevelt series on oh, yeah. PBS? Wasn't it absolutely wonderful? They could have mentioned Green Hills. But I, I came away from that realizing that we, as common men and women, we, we don't have a lot of issues compared to that family. I mean, we're, we're pretty simple life here. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing how it doesn't matter how you put your pants on, everybody has issues. Mm -hmm. So. Let's get started. I was going to do something beforehand and say a uh, disclaimer or whatever. I may hurt some feelings tonight, <laughs> but I don't really care because I, I'm here to basically show you, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but we're going to, we're going to do an awful lot of pictures tonight and we're going to do an awful lot of comparisons. So all I can say is Green Hills is a wonderful Greenbelt community of the three communities that were built during the Great Depression, and it's just a wonderful story to talk about. So I'm Paul Richardson, and before Green Hills, there was uh, 1816 to 1936. And James Whalen settled here in 1804, one year after Ohio was admitted. He built a house up on the hill, beautiful brick house. He was a justice of the peace, he ran a distillery, and he had 13 children. Wow. So, you know, that was kind of interesting. Well, it later became known as the Marquardt House. And in 1936, the Resettlement Administration bought the house. And presently, it's owned by the village of Green Hills. And I'm going to, these are some of, the, some of the pictures. Let's see if I can figure out my pointer here. This was the house when it was uh, bought by the Resettlement Administration. Pretty dilapidated. Pretty, uh, in pretty bad shape. Uh, then this is a picture of... Uh, Mr. Marquardt's delivery wagon, and the name of his farm was called High Point Farm because it was the highest point in Hamilton County. This was a, this was a picture that was uh, from 1919, and it's interesting the house is red brick today, but most of the pictures I have of the house, it was either whitewashed or painted white, and also it had this beautiful front porch. This is a picture I took uh, on January 3rd of this year. I think it was minus 10 degrees, but I love to photograph things, so I got out in the in the cold weather, but it's a beautiful house and it's listed on the National Register. Paul, what's in there now? What's in there now? What's There's a company and I don't know the name of it. It's going to be Elix. Elix. It's ready. Okay. So after, after 1930s, the early 1930s, basically the, the uh, country was going into a big depression. And this gentleman up here on the uh, left is Rexford Tugwell. And he was a genius. And he basically was hired uh, with the Roosevelt administration, uh, and he was in a, what was called the Brain Trust, a bunch of people that Roosevelt got together to, uh, to do these things uh, and develop the green towns. This is an early sketch of Green Hills. And of course, Tugwell was very, a very famous person. He was on the, mag and it was on the cover of Time magazine, and he worked for the Resettlement Administration. And in the lower corner is a picture of the drafting room in Washington, D.C. All the Greenbelt towns were, were basically designed and the drawings were all done in Washington, D.C. And a uh, gentleman right here in the middle, that's Clarence Stein, and he basically started this whole garden thing in the United States before uh, basically out in New York with, uh, uh, with Sonny, Sonny, what was it, I'm trying to remember. Sunnydale? Sunnydale, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's, he started this before, before even Tugwell got, got a hold of this, this information. So it was the New Deal. And basically it was to put people to work and make jobs and make jobs quickly in 1935. 
So the Resettle Administration estimated that Green Hills would employ 5,300 people. Well, at the, at the height of, re and he wanted to really hire people from the relief. So uh, the promises were a little bit over opt optimistic and uh, f more than 5,000 men were employed at one time, but at the, but, uh, but the height of the building in Green Hills, it was 1,200 men on the site. That's still a lot of people. What was the plan all about? This was what was really cool about Rexford Tugwell. He wanted to do this in hundreds and hundreds of towns and basically the Greenbelt towns were his early plan. He talked about getting people out of the ghetto. And what he wanted to do, I always call it the donut effect. He wanted to build towns where the center of town was the red area, and then the outlying areas was all the farm area, and the farmers would bring their produce into the city. So what he, he bought all this land in Green Hills, and originally, originally there were going to be many, many donuts. Can you imagine if this plan would, would have been done and executed today, how beautiful the United States would be with, with Urban straw, sprawl not really being there and having the green belt yeah, around everything. Back to that now. Yeah, we hope. But here's a here's a picture of a, again a plan for Green Hills. There was to be a uh, a uh, line that went out to Green Hills and went to downtown. One of the most important things about the development of the city, this or the town, this was before air conditioning, was the airflow through the town, the open spaces. And there were many, many books written about the green towns. And, as I was saying, in Washington, D.C., all these planners, draftsmen, architects, they were all doing these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drawings of the three Greenbelt towns. This, is, this happens to be some of the drawings of Green Hills. This is the town center. They had allotment gardens everywhere, paths that went everywhere through the village, and it was a self-contained town. Uh, drawings of everything, the typography. They even did uh, water studies on, on how much water and rain would be falling in the town. I mean, it was just total, total details. They even built models of the town. And these are some of the, uh, some of the drawings of the different sections of the town. Every last plant was identified. And there was a, there was a, there was a map that showed what the plants were and where they went. Every last planting in the, in the three towns was basically documented. And then, basically, they, they wanted to make the town center, and they had a common area. It's not commons, it's common. Somehow it got changed. They had play areas. They had a swimming pool, the town, the community building, the farmer's market, the business center, churches. It was all right there in the middle of town. Yes, go ahead. Interject. This was this was all this the minute that Roosevelt gave the orders. And maybe you said this before I came in, I'm sorry. But the minute he gave the orders, those architects in the first slide, they were put to work in Washington, DC, nineteen thirty five. All this stuff was planned. All all of it was planned before they even started looking for land. It was amazing. Here's, I'm sorry if you said go ahead. that already. Here's the shopping center. Here's, here's the administration office, here's the community building, the pool, the common area. So, and again, this was to put people back to work. Not only working people, but architects, designers, arts, everybody was getting a job. And here's some early sketches of, of, the, uh, of the town. One of the interesting things I found out, looking at closely at some of these pictures, uh, what, was, what were some of the sketches? If you look real close, there's, There's extra stories on the building. There's a <laughs> clock over here. And it says here, let's see. I'm trying to remember. They can get out here. The, the, the truth shall set ye free. That's what it says on the building. So that never really got put on the building, but that's what they were, that's what they were saying. So basically the, the RA administration uh, established in April of 1935, Tugwell wasted no time in getting the experiment going. By that summer, he had contracted Ed Edgar Raymond, a local real estate person, and he basically acquired 6,000 acres within a month. And I like the ending where it says they were thrifty class German farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was one farmer that didn't like the idea. <laughs> And his name was Mr. Bastion, and there's a little section in Green Hills that's right in the middle of Green Hills, 
And Mr. Bastion basically chased, chased the federal agents off with his rifle, and he actually shot at their vehicles. Uh, this, this over here in the corner, that's actually a sketch of how the village was supposed to look. And down in this corner, thanks to the Lippenmar family, this is how the village looked in 1946, the year I was born. <coughs> so here's how it all happened. April, April uh, 1935, Congress passed uh, Resolution 11, known as the Emergency Relief uh, Act of 1935. April 30th, President Roosevelt issued the executive order establishing the resettlement administration with his brain trust person, Rexford Tugwell. September 18th, basically the project was given the approval and the budget for Cincinnati was 11,150,000 and for the three green belts, it was 34 million. So on December the uh, 6th of 1935, he approved the purchase of 106 tracts of farmland for building green hills. 5,000, almost 6,000 acres of ground. December 15th, 1935, 16th, construction begins, and April 1st, 1938, the first families moved into the village. It's kind of interesting to know that they were the only electrified towns in the country. I was, I'm, I'm getting there. That's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. I'll get it. So now we're going to build the town. Here, here's, the, here's one of the... Uh, Resettlement administration cars with a really cool license plate on the front, and they used they used mules to build a lot to do a lot of the buildings. And the reason they did that because they wanted the men to basically have jobs. If they used electrified equipment or tractors or whatever, it would go a little faster. So they wanted everyone to keep their jobs. Rumor has it, and I actually think it's true, uh, Mrs. Emily Pulitzer Raw uh, Raw. Rao, she who had, had the, the really neat modern house over in Lachlan, she said that they used the mules in Green Hills to build her Woodlawn. property. Huh? Woodlawn. 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 Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> okay. So down in this corner are the houses being built, and I just found this out a rumor the other day that Mrs. Roosevelt insisted that the roofs be made out of tile. And here's a cold December day, uh, the village being constructed. It's amazing to see that prior slide, how fast it actually got going. You couldn't get anything off the ground that fast. No, down. you try this today, no, Phew, it, yeah. wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. That. They were, they were and, uh, I mean, that's what that one photograph is. You watch, architects in one room. Mm -hmm. You watched the, the series on the Roosevelts, and I mean, these people pushed, yeah, things got done. It had to get done because people had to get back to work. This is probably one of my favorite photographs. This is the community building be, being built. I think it's December of 30, 37, but you'll notice the smoke coming mm -hmm. out, of, out of there. And the building was red brick, mm -hmm. yeah. but it was painted white right. for two reasons. One, Roland Wang designed this building, and one was because of the white architecture for the international style. And I have a personal feeling that the white was also used because you got all these guys with three inch brushes and I know they had to give this building at least two coats of white paint. So, so they were busy fellows painting with paint brushes. If you look down here, this was, uh, these were actually used for the, uh, the curbing and this, this is granite curbing, which, which Pat, excuse me, should last forever or would have lasted forever. But here's a picture of the, uh, of the men going home after a uh, hard day's work, look at the line going way back there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The hard day's work in Green Hills. Where were they walking to? I have no idea. Oh. Somewhere where they got a from, ride. Uh, <laughs> April 38, the first families moved in. Was there still construction going on? I'm pretty sure it was pretty, pretty well done. It was pretty well done. Pretty well done. Oh. Yeah. That's cool. wasn't, the, wasn't the worker camp down with woods? I have no idea. Maybe some but you know what I'm thinking? Let's hold your question. Can we hold our questions to the end? Okay, because we don't want you to get off track. Okay, so, so here we are. It's April 1st, and everybody's ready to move into the village. Where's the buck shack? <laughs> so here, here we are. We're driving 35 miles an hour going up to the village. Uh, these are people unloading their, their uh, basically movie van. This is one of, another one of my favorite pictures because this is the village when it opened up. And you'll notice the shopping center was only half. The rest of it got built later. Oh. And what's really cool about this picture is the, the brick, it was a white building, but this brick, <coughs> red brick band that gave you, again, the horizontal feeling of the international style of architecture. 
Here's the swimming pool, the farmer's market, uh, the waiting pool for small children. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> but it's, it, the town is complete. It has everything that you want. It's a utopian town. I mean, everything is there. So September 38th, uh, 437 students moved, with kindergarten through 12 moved into the brand new community building school. One of the neat things about the community building, it had everything. It had libraries, it had canteens, it had, it had churches. Everything was centered around the community building. Well now, that beautiful library has been turned into our historical society museum. And back a few years ago, uh, the building, the room had been divided because the school got so crowded that they had to have more rooms. We uh, raised funds and took this partition out, which went all the way across here, and there was a clock. We can't seem to find where that clock is, but that's where the partition divided the room. Now it's our historical society museum. Thanks to Terry and everybody else, we researched the colors on all the shelving, and this is exactly the color it was when it was the library. So we like to do things authentic. We're working on a project now to try to get rid of these fluorescent lights and go back to the original schoolhouse lights. So here's the front of the building. Uh, it's changed also. If you go out front, you'll notice the lighting is now pretty rectangular. Originally, it was very Art Deco, very uh, international style. Uh, there were glass block windows everywhere. Those have now been bricked in. I have a speculation that back then, glass block was pretty primitive and they really didn't weld it together and they basically used lead and I think it leaked like crazy. I think that might have been one of the reasons they got rid of it. Mm -hmm. But here's a shot of the Green Hills Public Schools and you'll notice these big beautiful windows in the, in the uh, gymnasium. Well, the architects designed everything according to the way the sun rose and the sun set. So you would get beautiful sun in these windows. And here it is today, all bricked in. You'll notice this little evergreen when you go out tonight. It's oh. huge. It's still there. That is such a great picture, Paul. Well, thank you. <laughs> so when we moved into the neighborhood in the 80s, I was doing some research in the 90s, and I noticed, I took this picture in the late, late 80s, and I noticed that the building had been painted all white. Well, I did some research, as you saw from the old pictures, and originally this was exposed, con this was basically exposed concrete. And the reason Roland Wank designed it this way, because he wanted to give the building a vertical uplifting feeling, like Union Terminal, only he was doing it in Green Hills. So I talked to the school district, and I said, hey guys, get your gray paint out. So this white now became gray, which really helped the, which I see these little tiny details. <laughs> So you get inside the building and it's awesome too. It has all kinds of art everywhere. So up in the, uh, what was originally the music room, which is now the alumni room, was, was basically the music room. And uh, the mural in there was painted by Paul Chinlaw. And what's really cool about this, they have a Marquette, which was the original canvas drawing of the whole wall. I love the old fashioned lights too. But Paul, Paul was quite a character. And then we move on to our, our now museum, and we have a frieze in that room by Richard Zollner. And basically, he painted this beautiful frieze all around the room, uh, and he even depicted the 1937 flood because Green Hills was being built during the 1937 flood. He uh, eventually taught classes at the University of Alabama Department of Art and, uh, and, and Painting and, and Printmaking Department. And he passed away in 2000. Golly, has it been that long? 2003. Seems like only yesterday. And this is a picture of him basically doing his charcoal sketches, what, what eventually became the beautiful mural in our, in our uh, museum. This was on one of the walls, and we think it was a canvas. We originally thought it was painted on the wall, but we had a, a conservator come in, and this is now missing. So if anybody knows anybody or goes to a garage sale and sees something like this, buy it. <laughs> but this depicted a young family moving into the village. Behind here is the community building. It's a young family with their children. There's even some doves in the corner. And this is, again, some, some of the mural. And here's Mr. Zoner's signature. And look at the symbolism in that middle picture. Look at all that. The doves. The, the dog. dog. The dog. You can have a dog. <coughs> the, the little baby. Just, yeah, just look at all that. Yeah. 
I mean, it's just really cool what he did. But he was basically worked for the, the Federal Arts Project. They, everybody got jobs. <coughs> and this is a bas relief in the gymnasium by Vernon Atchley. And this thing is 10 feet across by 13 feet high, I think. Mm -hmm. And we had the uh, conservator come in, and this is in really, really good shape. And That's there's a there's also a nice little, uh, I don't know, what, what do we call that then? This plateware, actually. Yeah. He, was, he did a plateware freeze, and it actually has enamel, and the enamel has a mica compound in it, one of the first in the United States used. And when the, the, um, the projector would project onto the screen that they would put up, it would, it would fluoresce under the projector light, the scattering of the projector light. At first we thought it was masonite, but we, we didn't know, so we found out. Ah, uh, this is a sad story. Leo Murphy, he painted a 180 foot long mural in the cafeteria in the community building basement. It was a whimsical thing about the whole community. Unfortunately, it was painted on cinder block, which is very porous, and uh, it's now being used for a maintenance facility and it's been painted over. It was one of the unique, most unique methods of painting by him. But here's, the here's the whimsical, I mean, it was just a really neat, mm -hmm. and, and they used it for a canteen, they had, they had ping pong tables down there. This was the kindergarten room, and this is depicting the shopping center, with people at the shopping center. And even the Democrats had meeting in that room. <laughs> <laughs> we, did have, we did have Democrats once upon a time. <laughs> just a little pun. But unfortunately, it's gone forever. We had a conservator come in, and there's absolutely no way this could ever be restored. The school board denied it was there. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> small, small token. That's what they well, told you. well, here's here's yeah. here's the here's basically the plan for the town, and it was just a wonderful place. The common, the shopping center, the administrative offices, a future theater, the gas station, and these were going to be future shops over here that were to be built. The farmers market, parking. The swimming pool. I love this arch entrance to the swimming pool. And back here, I'll talk a little more about that later, was to be an amphitheater. But just a beautiful town plan. Do you have a question? So, I, I just was curious. So the way that in that picture it looked like, so where the Whitten Road is, there would have been a theater that would have been backing into Whitten Road? No, no. This is, where the golf course. This is Whitten Road right here. Okay. And then this is the farmer's market, and behind the swimming pool oh, okay. the was the amphitheater. But where would the theater, is? I thought you said there was a theater. Right here, where the bowling alley is today. Oh. That's yeah. the proposed movie theater. That was, oh. would have been the movie house. Yeah. Okay. But there, again, the funds were cut back, and the amphitheater was back here. But I'll talk a little more about the amphitheater, and again, how the architects planned things a little later. But it was a cooperative spirit, and the, the town was designed to basically get people involved. And the Green Hills planners hoped that Green Hills would dis dis demonstrate the value of co cooperation by building on the tradition of American idealism. So they started the cooperative. Everything was a cooperative, the drugstore, the grocery store, merchandising store, the gas station, and everybody worked at these places. And at the end of the year, they basically turned in their sales receipts and they got distributed the money by the volume of the purchases. Really cool idea. Co cooperatives, by the way, out west, I'm not sure about the mid Cooperatives out west, uh, we went through one in Albuquerque, but they're making a really big comeback. Here's an original uh, picture of the people that worked at the cooperative services. And this is one of the original pictures of the shopping center. It was called the Green Hills Consumer Services. Love the old cars. The only co-op that's remaining is the Green Hills Preschool Co-op. But it's still there. Uh, some original pic, this is an original picture of the shopping center. This was an arcade and it went all the way around the building. Now where the, where the Creamy Whip is, you could walk undercover around the whole building and get to the post office. You didn't have to worry about the rain. And this again is the, one of those early shots. I, I'm trying to figure out why all these trees were there, but the early shots show park benches. But I think the fact that it was the community's shopping center and Winton Road was a little two-lane road, it, they didn't really care about hiding the shopping center or that people would sit maybe underneath the trees in the summertime. But here's, here's an old shot, again, of the, uh, of the village center. 
This one is not quite so old. This was taken in 1986. The shopping center still looks pretty good, and we don't have the hodgepodge signing everywhere. We do have this big, giant sign that says Green Hill Shopping Center with an arrow pointing down. That got blown down by a storm. When was that picture? 70s? 1986. Really? That, that soon. We lost, the, we lost that um, sign in a big windstorm, some kind of storm, and huh. knocked it off and we never replaced it. Some early pictures of the uh, village center again, and you'll notice the horizontal banding of the line to make, again, to make that low horizontal feeling. The public uh, service was the fire department and the police department. Everything was in the village center. You could go pay your taxes. You could go see the administration. You could go visit with the fire department. It was all in one location. When did that move out of there to the hill? In the 50s? Yeah. Late 50s, 59. There were a couple, a couple of the people wanted to build the new service thing right in the middle of the problem. Oh. <laughs> of course they did. Of course they did. And here's, here's my biggest complaint. Oh. They have hundreds and hundreds of drawings up at the up at the administration office of the way the village originally looked. I said plants, everything. Why did they not follow the plan? That's okay. You can do it. Okay. This is 1959. This is Christmas, and they're selling Christmas trees in, in, at the village center. And what was really neat is they had a bus service that went to downtown Cincinnati from Green Hills. I've heard a lot of stories that the bus would usually break down coming up that big hill and have to get out and whatever. So, and here's the shopping center then and today, and we're seeing a revival maybe. So that's kind of the good news. And uh, you know, I think these kind of shopping centers are going to make the comeback because the big mall, the days of the big mall, are over because of the internet and online shopping. So I think these small malls with coffee shops. Shoe repairs. Every, everybody yeah. wants to get in and get out because we don't have time. So I think we're sitting on a gold mine here. Somebody said gold mine. <laughs> so anyway, but here's some pictures of the uh, shopping center originally, and here it is today. You'll notice up here on the top, these were transom windows. Of course, we didn't have air conditioning, so they opened up these transom windows and had a window in the back, and that's called early air conditioning. Cross ventilation. Yeah, we had a food locker. Like I said, the town had water. everything. It was just amazing. They had parties at the food locker. You could rent out space at the food locker. Could you rent out a, 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 free, a freezer? You <laughs> could go freeze there? Yes, part, the party in the food locker. <laughs> oh, and this is, the, this is the original grocery store in the co-op. All these places are now gone. The hitching post was yeah. had the world's best fried chicken. Okay, yeah. they, I remember it. <laughs> and, and the bowling alley didn't open until November 29, 1953. So it came along a little later. Interesting, I like to compare, this is an original door with the beautiful horizontal aluminum banding, and this is a modern whatever they want to call it. Yeah. And then a few years back, the uh, neon sign went out on the library, but all the residents uh, went in together, and the neon sign is back. I think it was like $1,800 to restore it. Yeah. But we do have a public library, and in 2002, they were going to take that library away from us, oh, but the, like, the whole like town that. fought to, the, to, to save the library. Yeah. And here's a picture of that area today. I call this the hodgepodge of the Green Hill Shopping Center. Some early pictures. Oh, turn back. Turn back? Yeah, we recognize that, that car. See the red Buick in the left? That's, That's my mother's home. car. She must have been at work. <laughs> <laughs> this is Fritz Kuhlman. His mother, Carol, used to be the postmaster. So that was mom's, mom's car. Right? Glad you recognize that. Okay. <laughs> These are some early pictures again of the, of the public safety or the fire department. One of the yeah. interesting things I found out before the building was added onto next door was it was a little diner called the Pioneer. Okay. Kind of like an ice, kind of like a, a Dairy Queen, only it was called the Pioneer. You can see it said the Pioneer up there. And here's some here's some of the firemen standing out front. And this is that lovely building today, which they've added a second story. You can still see. This brick area, that's where the entrance to the, to the, uh, the fire station was. Space and, they put over and notice the rounded corners. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. just and and the, the uh, lettering was very typical of the international modern style. 
Well, they moved up on the hill, you know, what the heck, you know, we got to build new buildings and do new things. But, but in the old days, they did have a lot of fun practicing on those flat roof buildings with the fire department, so. Mm -hmm. And here's one that's really the interesting. Oh, this whoa. was the old Shell station, which is very, very modern looking. And uh, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I always call, say, the Mansard roof salesman came through Green Hills. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a Mansard roof, don't ask me why. All the, the original filling station was a so higher standard oil. Yeah. And you had two stations. Uh -huh. Two? I, I, yeah. Oh, you were talking about Texaco. That was behind. Yeah, yeah there was, was where down the down keg is now. There were two gas stations. Really? Oh, yeah, there was yeah. a Texaco down yeah. there. Yeah. That was much later. But let's go back to the plan and look at what really is going on. The golf course was supposed to be a ravine park with beautiful walking trails. Here's that amphitheater. Here's your... Uh, your farmer's market back here, and that's the farmer's market. And thanks to Forest Park uh, Kiwanis, they restored that. And now we're bringing the we're bringing the uh, the market back, and we're having our harvest fest on October 25th this year, from three to ten. Three to ten. That's so so, neat. so it's making a comeback. And what what was interesting about this little farmer's market? I had a secretary at the International Paper, and her stepmother and father ran that market for many years. And I said, Lois, do you have any pictures? No one has any pictures of the farmer's market. So you have pictures of the farmer's market? I farm? wonder if there's some in the shopping center. Just call us. This is another neat picture that I really like of the pool when it had the men's and women's uh, dressing areas. But what I loved about this picture, of course, the pool opened in 1938, and there were no swimming pools around anywhere. Everybody mm -hmm. came to Green Hill. But look at these beautiful evergreens mm -hmm. behind the pool, all gone. And here we are, every last planting over here was a list every last planting, every tree, every whatever. And what was really cool, there was a little play area here, which was where the little wading pool was. They had swings and things right here behind the, behind the little wading pool. Unfortunately, I think the next, well not the next slide, but, but this is a picture. This picture was actually taken in 1986, and this is it today. And the pool was renovated in 1996. The dressing areas are now gone. And here's a picture again of the swimming pool. But what's really interesting, remember that little waiting pool? Remember that little waiting pool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow this June it disappeared mysteriously. And it's now gone. And we keep going to council meetings, we keep saying, maybe you can't renovate it right now, but the more you tear down, you're going to lose your opportunity to become a national landmark because you have to be have ninety percent of your property. I guess the problem here was the little tykes just couldn't vote. This is our golf course. And this was the area I was talking about, which was to be the amphitheater. And the really cool thing about this I like very much is you have to picture the sun is coming up in the east and setting in the west. Go down here and sit on this hill someday. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful venue. It's just wonderful. What's really nice about this is the entertainers there's no sun in the evening. The sun's over here. The entertainers can entertain you. Well, they decided we're going to build a Victorian gazebo on the commons. Well, the gazebo faces west. And in the evening at 7.30, that sun is just blasting in those entertainers' eyes. Well, unfortunately, the Blues Brothers don't entertain here every week, but they do have to wear their sunglasses. But it's all about planning. You know, they could have planned this a little better. They could have basically built an amphitheater. It's a natural mm -hmm. sloping area. And that it's, is the whole point of beautiful. everything. They, they looked at the land, they maneuvered things so that the land and the buildings became one. Right. Because they weren't even here. They were in Washington, D.C. Right. And they sent people out. This is kind of a vision I had of what the amphitheater. This is a amphitheater in Plainfield, Indiana. And I, I think it could have really looked like that. But just, yeah. they did it all. Well, we have churches, and unfortunately, I haven't included the Lutheran Church for one reason, because the Lutheran Church is in the Bastion Tract, which really isn't in Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So we have churches in Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we have the American Legion Post. It was chartered in April 19th of 1939, and originally it was located in the shopping center, and then in 1943, they rented the old Marquardt or the Whalen House. And it was an empty shell then. Mm -hmm. And they basically rented it for $1 a year from the federal government. So they renovated the house, and fix it up, and then in 1950, 
they purchased the property next door to the house for $12,000. So in 1958, the property was sold to the village of Green Hills, and basically uh, they decided that they were going to build a brand new building and for $75,000. Uh, Mrs. Hugh Watson provided a lot of the funds for the building, and of course the post is named after her World War I flyer husband, Hugh Watson. Can I, um, Go ahead, Debbie. <laughs> you want to hear? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just want to mention that the Marquardt, or the Whalen House, as I call it, because that's the original owner, the Whalen House actually was um, owned by Mrs. Hugh Watson, It was supposed to. It was actually a letter from the from the resettlement yes. is recommending that it become a historic yes. museum. Wow. And I'm going to go something here. I'm not sure what Debbie's going to write, but there's all kinds of interesting stories about the Whale House it being an underground railroad. The Joneses who live in California. There's some black history going on. Yes. I, I won't tell you all that, but that's that's coming up maybe in another book. Okay, the housing types. Roland White. He designed Union Terminal. He and his team of architects basically developed nine basic exterior house plans with 33 different interiors. And the resettlement administration sur surveyed the prospective tenants, and a lot of the people were really interested in more bedroom space and, and showed no interest in their dining rooms. I don't know why, because everybody was, wasn't fast food back then. But anyway, that's what they preferred. Many of the buildings in the A&B section were of the colonial revival style. And the rest of the village was basically characteristic of the international style of architecture. And these are some of the, again, some of the drawings that they came up with for the different styles in the buildings. I, I love, I love this little sketch yeah. in the stepped areas <coughs> of the building. Mm -hmm. And Good you'll back. notice this is pretty much, uh, pretty much matches that. What's really interesting about the international or modern style? Very few accoutrements. They didn't have shutters. It was less is more. Keep it simple. So these shutters really don't go, and they were very, very absent of front porches. All that window is an abstraction of a double hung window with shutters. Which window? This one? No. No, right. No, down. Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look at it. Yeah. No, it's just the way the window is built. It was two long panels on either side. No, that, window re that represents the shutter. The below. That represents the shutter. That's a shutter, but isn't a shutter. It's a window. It's like a line drawing. I love this this particular picture over here. I think it's just a beautiful yeah. picture. Yeah, they don't need external shutters. And here again, here's here's that international style with you know with the addition of the shutters and the building to the far right. Uh, somebody I guess had trouble with their flat roof and decided to go with a with a with a hip roof. And what I think would be cool, because we've really improved our, our membranes and our stuff, and I was just talking to the guy that's doing the Troubadour, and he said, you know, I was up on the roof the other day, and all those drains on that roof are all stopped up. And guess what? If you're going to stop up your drain, you're going to have roof problems. Right. Yeah. And what I envision is, is young people moving in and taking these flat roofs. I'll tell you later about how the construction, but you could build a really beautiful outside dining area on your roof. Okay, the government set the standard. The rents were $37 a month for a two-bedroom apartment, and you had to accept the government rules. No one could drive nails in the wrong. It was, it was basically uh, pretty, pretty strict to live there. Uh, only the government work who could point, paint the houses and only certain colors, and for some strange reason, all the, all the doors were painted blue, and I think it has to do with red, white, and blue, patriotic. Who knows? <laughs> One of the interesting things about the, about the government doing things, we actually found this. We have a, a, a kitchen replica in our in our history oh, yeah. museum, and the butcher block tops have the basically the house number on the underside. Every spring, the government would come in, take the butcher blocks out, sand them down, refinish them, and put them back in cleanliness. <laughs> you didn't really have to do anything. And here's some examples of some of the townhouses. I think this one is now gone. Copper gutters, mm -hmm. and this is this is one of this is one of my favorite ones that really has pretty much kept the original architecture except for the front porch. But this one, 
This one is originally a flat roof, and it had the, but it's good having the roof. But the spacing between that mm -hmm. and and the sidewalk, the green spaces again are very very important. This is another one of my favorite ones over on Farragut Street. This was one of the original sketches. Notice the uh, the iron railing. Well, they kept that, but they put the gable roof on. One of the neat things. Remember my remember my picture I showed you of the mm -hmm. yeah. of the community building and the architecture and the style of the light, guess what? It's still there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And I love these buildings, the way they set back, and, you know, just the way they offset the domino effect. Sad thing happened a couple years ago, the nice mm -hmm. horizontal storm doors, they put oval-shaped storm doors. Victorian. Very Victorian. Yeah. Oh, here's my, one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Again, <laughs> the Mansard Roof salesman came to town. But, it, it, the building basically looks like this, and I think the building is brick. Don't ask me why they did this siding like this. And again, it's a two-story building. And most most of the times, back in the turn of the 19th century, when they did when they did these roofs, it was to add space in the attic, so you didn't have a hip, so you got more space. But this building has a second story on it. Don't ask me why. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I said the Colonial Revival. These, these are the, some of the early sketches in this reflects some of the colonial revival style again. Uh, no shutters. Really cute little houses with tile roofs. And a lot of times they took one of the houses and they just basically mirrored it and made a, a double out of it. Lots of playgrounds for kids to play in. And here's the community building today. And they had five playgrounds in pocket and it, the kids could play everywhere. It was just, you know, you, you didn't have to worry about traffic in the street. And again, they had these little pocket parks everywhere that you could go play with. And here's one of the original drawings, and it shows exactly what kind of play equipment would go into that area and the spacing. Look at the way the houses face in the back and all the space between the houses and the play area. Well, guess what? They were all gone in the late 80s. Every last one of them was gone. Well, last year in July, guess what? We dedicated a new playground. Wow, there's a concept. <laughs> Street lights. This is one I can't figure out for the life of me. Yeah. These, I just don't know why they all disappeared too. Are you going to talk about the backwards house? I can. Go back. Okay. okay. The houses face backwards because what happens was your kitchen was in the front, and your the service area. Service area. By the road. And and basically the living area was behind. So you could look out and see the green spaces. So it's, it's backwards housing. Watch the kids. And these are the street lights, which are amazing because they're all gone. I don't know when they went. I can't. I'm going to do some research. I think they went away in the late '60s. They were just all taken out. But they were painted forest green or maybe even army green. But there was even a call box to call, you know, the police. It was a pretty safe neighborhood. But you know, and most of these. Teardrop shapes were repeated on the porch lights. So everything matched. There's two left at the uh, swimming pool. They're painted into this icky silver. One has There's one. one Jack Manning's back there. Oh, Jack Manning's yeah. back there. I'm not kidding. But the really neat thing about these were they're really romantic at night. And the lady was talking about a total electrified community and, and electric stoves. People would co drive up the hill and they would they would say, God, an aliens landed because it was an electric town. It wasn't gas light. It was total electricity. And you thought this big alien spaceship had landed in Green Hills. Well, they've tried an attempt. And last time I was in the village, I, I counted at least six different lights standards. And one, one, of the, one of the really big complaints lately is people don't like the fact that the street lights are lighting their second story bedrooms rather than the right. street. We won't go there. So they tried an attempt, uh, I think, Oh, a few years back, maybe eight or ten years back, on the commons, common, and they put these in, and this was the original, very modern, very plain, very mechanical looking light. Well, this is Victorian. We just need to be a Victorian community. Well, what was really interesting, I kept looking at this one over here, and I said, this looks familiar. Well, Karen and I lived in an old section in Indianapolis, which was built in the 1870s, and sure enough, their street lights have this character to them. So, yeah, what the heck? Green Hill signage. Uh, that's changed over the years, too. 
uh, one of the interesting things was the original lights with these uh, street signs with these finials on top. These were blue, and guess what? The lettering was fluorescent, and you could see it at night where you were going. Well, now we have to turn our heads sideways. Oh, that's the wood court. And, and this is a night maintenance nightmare as far as paint. Well, some of the early signs, that when we moved here in the 80s, they, they still had these. And we think these were designed by the CCC because they were called basically Park Rustic, Rustic because they're in all the national parks and all the state parks. This is the one at Giant City. And Green, uh, green Belt still has theirs. Well, what was really cool about these, you see we've got a bolt here and a bolt there. So when the business changed, you slide that out and you put a new one in. Yeah. Whoa, that's pretty cool. But there's My some of- My most favorite one was the entrance to Green Hills coming over the bridge in the, in Winton Woods, in the park. You go over the bridge and then you go, start going up the hill. And on the right, there was that rustic signage. Yeah. And it said, Green Hills, the heart of the park. It said that. It's in the park. That's cool. Well, here's some of the signage today. Well, Johnny's is gone, but it used to be the word out. People say, well, how do I get to Green Hills? Yeah, look for that Johnny toy sign. And that's how you got to Green Hills. So this, the signage today is very, very hodgepodgey, and it's just all over, all over the place. I've also included some examples of, of, of what Greenbelt's sign look like. Very, very plain, very simple, and very readable. OK, my favorite part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Green Hills tries to redevelop itself. This is the wet over here. This is where the town's being built. Interesting, the village tore down over 52 units. And they decided they were going to basically redevelop that area. This is DeWitt Court, and I always call this DeWitt Court naked because what they did was they decided to rip all the siding off and they let this building set for months. And the, the object, I think, was a drama scene because if I drive by this place and it really looks ugly, we need to tear it down. Yeah. Well, if you were standing naked in the middle of winter, you'd look pretty ugly too, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but what was so cool about this when they, when they basically hired a company, which was, I thought was really cool to recycle all the materi materials, it's called building value, which was really a good thing to do. Well, they took the old hip roof off and they found the original flat roof. I think these are two by eights or two by tens. And the structure was built to last. <laughs> the supervisor from building value came up to me and said, what's wrong with these people? These things were built to last. And he actually lost money tearing his houses down. Yeah. It took him a longer yeah. amount of time. When they pulled the tar paper off the siding, the, si yeah. the, the, the um, base of the building, they, it looked like it had just been delivered. Yeah, wood, wood. Just been delivered yesterday. I heard a rumor that, that the people, the, the federal agents came in, and I don't know where, where the, the lumber came from, from Glendale on a train or whatever, but if there were too many knots in the wood, the government agent would basically send the wood back and say, sorry, we got to have the best wood for this. But what was really cool, there were 52 units. Now, this is what I'm doing. I, I'm not, I didn't do very well in math in, in high school, but I'm, I'm looking at 52 units, and I'm saying, well, let's divide, let's divide these, well, let's get to that a little later. Let's look at, <laughs> let's look at this one. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. Six. Now count. One, two, three, four, five. There's only five. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Oh, you cut that one off. The village needed an acre of ground to, to basically build what was called a PUD. And they, they partnered with the Hamilton County Planning District and they came with a planned unit development and they needed an acre of ground, so they tore off the end unit of this particular building. Isn't that? Well, the sad part was, when they put the siding on, they did the narrow side, didn't even match the siding. Oh boy, that's preservation for you. All they needed was one unit to get their acre of ground. Oh, here's my favorite part, DeWitt Landing, the beautiful development in Green Hill.